My lab is interested in understanding a particular part of a cell that's present on the surface of cells, and it's called cilia. So you should think of cilia as being a little hair that's found on almost all cells in your body. Some cells have a lot of these, and when they do, these cilia actually move, and they're such as the flagella on a sperm. But almost every cell, however, has at least one. And when there's only one, it usually does not move. Instead, it sticks out into the environment around the cell, and it's receiving all the information that's out there around the cell, and it's sending that information from outside into the cell and telling the cell what it needs to be doing at any particular time. There are a host of disorders that are collectively known as ciliopathies, so disorders affecting cilia, that have this huge range of symptoms for patients that include diabetes, obesity, blindness, reversed organs, organs that have fluid-filled sacs and therefore can't function normally, too many fingers, too many toes. We use two different model systems to understand how cells make, maintain, and take these structures apart. And the first system that we use is a one-celled green algae called Chlamydomonas reinhardii, but almost everyone would know it as plankton from SpongeBob. So plankton, you know, has those two antennae on his head. Well, those antennae are actually cilia. And in the lab, plankton doesn't care whether or not it has cilia, which means we can make mutations in a whole host of different genes that are involved in making cilia and making them functional. And then we can go in and identify what the genes were that we affected. We take that information from plankton and we go back to the human genome and ask, are there similar genes in the human genome? In which case, it's almost always yes. And then we ask, can we find mutations in those genes that are associated with patients who have been diagnosed with one or more of those ciliopathies? And again, the majority of the time, the answer is yes. So we're in the lab using the information that we're learning from this rather simple organism, plankton, and being able to apply it to humans. And we think that by taking this approach, that we'll be able to identify novel proteins that are involved in ciliary function and identify when those proteins are defective in patients. And that will allow us to identify and develop novel uh, treatments for patients who suffer from ciliopathies.